All right, so we've got uh, two online, and we do have the um, we do have the previous two classes um, on. I think they're on our YouTube channel. So the first one is from the um, the Zoom, the original Zoom. The second one, because Miriam did not remind me last week for this, um, we forgot to record it. So I went into the studio and just did kind of a 25 minute recap. It wasn't nearly as good as being live and <laughs> present, but it was, it was a condensed version of it. So it went okay. Another person coming in, here they are. Hey Kyle, hey. All right. This is going to be good. Next two chapters are great in John's Gospel, chapter three. Keep yours open because um, my version is the NRS. No, mine is just the RSV. So when I went to college in 1979, um, I needed a Bible. I mean, I had kind of this, the Bible back then was called the Good News Bible. And it was it was a paraphrase. It wasn't, you know, when you're thinking about a, 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 a Bible to get, people always ask me, what Bible? You know, what, what translation and such? And, and really, if you're going to go that deep, I mean, the, the problem is people aren't reading any Bibles. <laughs> so what I, my, first, my first response is, any Bible that you're going to read is the Bible you should read. But if you want to go a little bit deeper, You've got two different kinds. You've got um, the paraphrase, which is like a good news Bible. And what a paraphrase does is uh, they read from the English and they dumb it down to like a third or fifth grade level. That's really what it is. The, the King James Version, you know, um, is really written at a 12th grade level. So the good news is probably more like a fifth grade level, which, you know, I know is insulting to all of us smart people in the room here. But when you think about most media, most, most newsprint, most everything else, it's probably more at that, that fifth, grade, fifth grade level. Paraphrase. Great for just kind of devotional reading. And then you have translations. The translation doesn't go from the English to English. It goes from the Greek or Hebrew, but Greek in the New Testament, into English. So it's the actual translation. So you, uh, and then there are just, you know, a bazillion different kinds of translations out there. Every Monday when we have worship planning, we take a look at the text and we read it maybe in two or three or four different translations to see which one highlights what we would like it to highlight. So um, they're, they're different. But what the translation does, it gives you a more accurate reading. It may be a difficult, more difficulty in terms of the reading comprehension, but it's more accurate. Now there's one translation that we often go, and my go-to, by the way, is NIV. NIV. NIV is the most popular English translation in the world. NIV. The hybrid in between, the hybrid in between is called the NL, New Living Translation, NLT. NLT. Does anybody have an NLT here? Yeah, NLT is pretty good. What the NLT does, it takes it from the Greek, but then they don't translate it word for word as you would do in the translations like the NIV. They translate it phrase to phrase. So it is, it, is, it, is, it is readable, like the paraphrases, and it is fairly accurate. But when you're getting into like a Bible study and really saying, you know, my translation says this, you know, NLT is a little loosey-goosey on some of the words and the phrases. Easier to read, though. Good, so let's get into chapter three. So my RSV, I took from my mom's library 
there at home because I needed something more than my good news. And so this went with me through um, 13 years of theological classes. So it has all the answers in it. You know, this is one of my prized possessions here. If, if I lose this, um, I'm going to have to go pump gas in Southern California for a while until I can re-mark up a whole nother one here. Chapter three. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees. Remember, we have four different sects of Judaism. Pharisees were the lay movement. And by the time Jesus came along, they were the obnoxious lay movement. That is, they became, um, they were originally called the separate ones. The separate ones are the holy ones because they were fulfilling all the law back in 165 BC. But by now, they have become militant about it. That's why we use that phrase today. Oh, you're such a Pharisee or a Pharisaic attitude. Um, that's that judgmental. So by the time of Jesus, it became that more judgmental. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. Anybody know when Nicodemus comes up a second time in the Gospels? At the death of Jesus. There, Nicodemus and his buddy, Joseph of Arimathea, they take the body and they place it into Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. But Nicodemus is there. So Nicodemus is part of the ruling class. I mean, he's not a Sadducee in the, um, you know, the clear, clergy time, but he's pretty high up. He's pretty high up. Now, there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a ruler of the Jews. This, what other translations do you have for that? Ruler of the Jews. Jewish religious leader. Anything else? Jewish ruling council, which may have very well have been the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the Jewish ruling council, usually made of Sadducees, but here we have Nicodemus. So anyways, he's on the high echelon of the political ruling class of Judaism in Jerusalem. Verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night. All right. Here's where John, the gospel, is just very clever in its use of words. On a very surface level, what does this suggest that he comes to him at night? Maybe he came to Jesus after work. You know, he had to go to work first. It is nighttime. That's number one. Go a little bit deeper. What does it suggest he comes to midnight? doesn't want to be seen. Jewish leader seeing this itinerant, uneducated, penniless, homeless rabbi doesn't want to be seen. You go a little bit deeper, and perhaps this may be a stretch, but perhaps Nicodemus truly is coming to him in the dark. That is, he has no idea who Jesus is and what this means. So whatever layer we want to go to. Come to it at night and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that comes from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Oh, man, talking about the buttering up flattery of it all. Sometimes when you hear the Senate speaking and one uh, senator from one side of the aisle will speak about the other one says, my good and esteemed colleague and friend from the great state of Kansas, which means nothing because they are at each other's throat. This is kind of the buttering up the politicians will do. Rabbi, we know that you must come from God because the great things that you do could only come from the Lord God Almighty. And Jesus says, well, thank you very much. They are pretty spectacular. No, he doesn't say that. What does Jesus say here? Jesus said, he doesn't even take the bait. Truly, what? Truly. The double. Remember, we talked about this with six. Six, six is really the uh, symbol of the devil. Whenever something is repeated twice, pay attention. Three times, 
stop everything. This one's twice, truly, truly, and the word is actually amen, 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 amen. I say to you, now remember your English grammar here, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, he hasn't even addressed anything Nicodemus does, right? So I want to hear your translation. Unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Give me another translation. Born again. We'll read the whole clip. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Good. Anything else? Anything different than that? All right. So this is, in philosophical terms, a conditional clause. If this happens, then that can happen. This must happen in order for that to happen. So unless, that is, this is the first part of the conditional clause, unless a person is born anew or born again, or born from above. He may not. No. He cannot. And remember, remember from your English the difference between may I and can I. Many a kids, maybe perhaps middle school, maybe older, said, Teacher, can I go to the bathroom? And the good English teacher will say, I'm sure you can, Johnny. But I think what you're asking me is, may I go to the bathroom? May is the permission, can is the ability. So in this conditional phrase here, unless someone is born again, he cannot, that is, he does not have the ability to see the kingdom of God. So to see the kingdom of God, the very first part of the conditional, you must be born again. Now, I mentioned going to college in 1979. And um, in 1976, remember who was elected president? Correct, Jimmy Carter. Good. <laughs> And Jimmy Carter was, was probably the first um, kind of the born again president. He was very outward about being born again. Even to today, at 90 plus years old, he still does a, a weekly Bible study in his church in Georgia. Born again. At the same time, there was another guy named Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson worked for Richard Nixon and kind of led the whole Watergate scandal. He was uh, arrested, imprisoned, and there in prison had a born again experience. So when I was in the 70s, that was just a huge topic. Are you born again? Are you born again? And the, really the question is, <laughs> do you have a date on the calendar in which you were not a Christian and then you were, became a Christian? Is there a significant time in your life history? And certainly, there are instances in the scriptures in which somebody has a significant thunderbolt experience like that. Like who? Acts chapter 9. Paul, right. Paul on the road to Damascus, knocked on his bum, there encounters Jesus, and really has that born again experience. However... However, lest you think when your Baptist friends corner you and tell you, tell me when you were born again, I want the date, the time, and what you saw. Think about scripture and how different people come to faith in different ways. Paul came to faith in a booming born again experience. How else did other people come to faith? Over time. Over time, like the babbling idiots called the disciples. They were with Jesus for three years and had no idea in whose presence they walked. It was an evolution over time, three years. 
There were people like Lydia who were baptized as an adult, the first baptism in Europe. There were other ones who were baptized as children when it says whole households were baptized. There were some who were argued into the faith, like the Athenians. There were others who were nurtured into the faith, like Timothy. My point is this. My point is this. There's no one way of being born again. When the evangelist up there tells you, all you need to do is recite this prayer, and it's easy as A, B, C, admit that you're a sinner, uh, believe in Jesus and confess your sins or commit your life, then you can become a Christian. Once I wasn't a Christian, and now I am a Christian. It usually doesn't, doesn't work that way, but it's not my words. And it's not Jimmy Carter's words. And it's not Chuck Colson's words. It's Jesus himself saying, you must be born again. What does that mean? So Nicodemus is asking that very question. What does this mean? Verse 4, Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's taking this very literally, right? Very literally. Has anybody here, <laughs> this is an old reference, ever seen the, the famous skip between Abbott and Costello, who's on first? Yes. You can Google that. I have to. <laughs> What's that? I have to. You have to? Mm -hmm. And it goes something like this. The two of the comedians, I don't know, they're way back in the black and white era. Who's on first? Who? The one on first. What? No, that's on second. What's his name? No. Who's on first? Who gets the check? No, what does? And they kind of go, they're, they're just not connecting. They're using the same words, but they're not connecting. This is the original Abbott and Costello, who's on first. You must be born again. It means I must climb into my mother's womb a second time and be born. No, let's see what else he says. Jesus said, truly, what? Truly, I say to you, unless, here it is conditional again, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What might that sound like? Born of water and the spirit. It sounds like baptism. I wish John would have come right out and said baptism. He does, and he alludes to it. He alludes to it. Six, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of, of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Just stop there. Why do we have to be born again? Why did Jesus use this imagery to explain what it's like to become a person full of faith and a, and a believer. Let me ask it a separate way. How many of you decided your parents and the date of your birth? No, not one, right? Perhaps this is a really good analogy to, that Jesus lets us know that just like you had no input, decision, choice, acceptance about your birth. It's really a passive event. Being born again is less about accepting, choosing, deciding on this day. And it's more about the spirit taking hold of us. Now, why is that? It's because in this fleshly self, in this human fleshly self, in this fallen Adam and Eve, fleshly self, I cannot desire the things of God on my own. I cannot desire the things of God. Do you know what do you know the definition of sin is? It's not lying and cheating and stealing. It's not knowing the difference between good and evil. The definition of sin goes back to the Garden of Eden there in chapter 3 of Genesis. When the snake slithers up to Eve and says, 
Um, did God really say that you couldn't eat any of the fruit of the tree in the garden? Here is the devil now overemphasizing the truth. And Eve knows. She says, no, 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 we can eat any fruit of the tree except this one. From this one tree, we can't eat. And then Eve says, we can't even touch it or we're going to die. Now, that wasn't true. It was that if, when you eat it, you're going to die. But she was just not even going to take any chances. I can't even touch it. And then the snake says, silly, you're not going to die. The day that you eat of that fruit, you will become like God. Like God. Lying and cheating and stealing are the outward manifestations of sin. But sin itself is a condition. It's a condition. I remember in my first church, there was a guy struggling with alcohol, and I said, I'll go to the AA meeting with you. And I went to one of my first AA meetings. And I remember somebody, you know, standing up and introducing themselves. Hello, my name is Tom. And I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 19 years. And I thought I misheard him. Oh, I'm Tom. I used to be an alcoholic. Or I'm Tom. I'm a recovered alcoholic. But I didn't misunderstand him, did I? Hi, I'm Tom. I am an alcoholic. And I haven't had a drink in 19 years. You see, he understood that the condition. The condition was alcoholism. Now, it manifested itself in drinking too much, losing your health, losing your job, losing your family, whatever else. Those are the manifestations. But the condition, the condition remained. In the same way, sin is a condition of fallenness, of separation between ourselves and God. Because, because, not because we lie, cheat, and steal, but because we want to become like God. Trusting ourselves and not God. Trusting our own decisions, acceptance and decisions, and not God's. So that's why when Jesus talks about being born again, or born from above, or born anew, it's a passive thing, just like your physical birth. Because we cannot desire or will the things of God unless... The spirit brings us to God, unless the spirit transforms this heart. This was the key point in the Reformation. You see, the Catholic Church believed that each one of us has a spark within us. The ability, the will to want to do what is right and the things of God. You take that will and you try just a little harder to go to church. And then do penance, and then do confessions, and then do service. And as you do your part, the church then infuses a little bit of grace as a reward. And as you do more, you get more grace. And together, you and God work out your salvation. You do your part, God does his part. What Luther did. He went back to Augustine in the 5th century, who went back to Romans, Paul's language here in the New Testament, and talked about all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. No, not one. You must be born anew. And how does that happen? Through choosing, accepting, deciding? Well, let's see what Jesus says. He says this, verse 8. The wind below, oh, the wind. Mine says the wind. What does yours say? Clever. Clever. Here's a word play that's going on that you don't catch. In, in Greek, there is a word, pneuma, that has three different meanings. You have to figure out the context. It could mean the wind. As in a pneumatic device, a pneumatic device has that air pressure in it, a pneumatic device, it can be wind, or it can be spirit. 
as in the Holy Spirit. And so you need to, or it could be breath, or it could be breath. You need to figure out from the context. And oftentimes in scripture, it's a play on words. So for instance, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, the spirit moved over. Is it the spirit? Or is it the wind blowing through? It's probably both. In the next chapter, chapter two, God takes up a lump of clay. He pokes in two holes into it. And what does God do? Oh, breathes on it. Is it God's breath or is it God's spirit? It's probably both. And here in John chapter three, Jesus says, the spirit blows where it wills. Are we talking? No, the wind blows where it wills. Are we talking about the wind? Or are we talking about the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, probably both, right? He's using that wind as the example. We can see the effect of it, but we don't know where it's going and how it's going. And I love to sail. And one thing about sailing that I would love to do better is to control the wind. If I could just get the wind to go in a consistent pattern, at a consistent speed, in a consistent direction, it would be a whole lot easier. But instead, I could have trimmed the sails, angle them, fluff them or tighten them to be able to receive the wind. Jesus says here, the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So, I guess the question is, how do we trim our sails? How do we trim our sails? so that we can receive the Holy Spirit when and where and however it blows in our lives? That's not a rhetorical question, putting it out there. How do we trim our sails so we can receive the Holy Spirit? You can go to a Bible study on Wednesday night without your parents telling you to, that's number one and do so with a receptive heart to receive it. Good. What else? Church. You can go to church, and not just because you have to, but get to go to church to be able to hear and to sing and to praise God and not check in your time. You can pray without ceasing, as the Bible says, or pray in a way that is receiving God's spirit. Now, in the end of it, at some point, probably without us even knowing, the spirit blows into our lives, and pretty soon that faith comes. For some, it is immediate, like a Paul on the road to Damascus. Other, it is taking 24 years for it to get here. But the spirit blows where it wills. Now, when the Spirit does come, do we sit around and say, well, at least I had to trim the sails. At least I had to put the boat in the water. At least I had to know enough to be able to, you know, move the angle to be able to, at least, I, see, whenever we want to take credit, we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and the whispering of the serpent, you want to become like God. To God alone be the credit. That's why the Reformation, the biggest first tenet of the Reformation is faith. What? Alone. Faith alone. And then it says in Ephesians chapter 2, even faith comes as a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, verse 8 and 9 even faith comes to us as a gift, lest anyone should boast. Nicodemus is still playing Abbott and Costello with him. We are now up to verse 9. Nicodemus says, how can this be? And remember, he's a ruling class of the Pharisees, and he's stumped. Jesus answered, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, what? 
Truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, you don't believe them. How can I, you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one descended from heaven, the Son of Man. You can just see Nicodemus here being overwhelmed, saying, what? I didn't even ask your question yet. And Jesus overwhelming him. Now, you may not know the reference here to the next verse here. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here's the story. In the wilderness, Moses was with these grumbling, stiff-necked, ungrateful people. So God sends snakes. And people are dying of this snake bite. Until, you know, Moses and God gets together and God tells Moses to make a bronze snake. Make a bronze snake. Put it up on a pole. And whenever anyone is bitten, all they need to do is look upon the snake and they will survive it, which is kind of a weird, kind of a pagan, kind of a superstitious thing. But it worked. It worked. Now, here's the, here's the question. How do you, if you've got a pole here, how do you attach that bronze snake to a pole so that everybody can see it? Even if they're far away, they can look to the bronze snake. Do you, do you tie it vertically? and just wrap it around the pole so it just looks like a solid pole? Probably not. If you're gonna put a bronze snake on there, what would you do? You'd probably put it across, you know, display it much like, I don't know, a cross. And so Jesus is saying here, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man that is himself must be lifted up What's he talking about? His cross. Remember, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. Others call him the Son of God, but Son of Man is a higher title. So that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That is, when you are bit by the serpent of this world and sucked into the darkness and sin, Jesus is saying the same thing. Look to the cross. Look to the cross. And there is salvation in the cross. And what he's saying here, put your trust not in yourself, not in how much Bible studies you go on a Wednesday night or in a church on Sunday morning or how many prayers you do or service hours you put in. Do not fall to the serpent's whispering. You will become like God. Don't take the credit. In fact, turn to God. Turn to the cross. Trust that the cross can do for you exactly what the cross promises to do. Transform your heart. Birth you anew and give you new life. And what does that look like? Next verse. Perhaps the most famous verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Often called the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world. So not just Christians, not just the good people, not just Jewish and Christians. They come from Abraham. Not just Muslims, Jewish and Christians but the whole world. That he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It is in that belief. It is in that belief. But how does that happen? How does faith come to be? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit, trimming the sails, perhaps, to receive the Spirit as it blows into our lives. 
We usually end right there, for God so loved the world and so on, but it continues on, verse 17. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. We think about the power of the cross. The power of the cross where Jesus takes on the sins of the entire world. Remember we talked about it last week as John the Baptist called Jesus what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as that perfect sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, he can indeed atone for all of the sins of all of the world. Verse 18, for he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. People sometimes have an erroneous understanding of heaven and hell. Um, as if God condemns people to hell. But really, as we hear here, 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 um, in other places, it is less about God sending people to hell. And it's more about the natural consequences of a life without Christ. More of a natural consequence of a life without Christ. So that's why he can say, for those who believe in Jesus, uh, not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. It's the natural consequence of separation from God. Verse 19, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light. That's that original sin. That's that fallenness. We turn to the darkness left to ourselves instead of the light. Verse 20, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be put exposed. But he who does what is true comes to light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought by God. All right. It's a big section there about being born again. Any thoughts or any questions you might have before we leap forward? All clear, huh? That's good. It took me four years of seminary to figure it out. You got it in 40 minutes. That's pretty good. Let's go on. Let's see what else comes up. The next section here, Jesus baptizes in Judea. Did you ever hear before that Jesus never baptized anyone? I don't know if you ever heard that before. It is, it is not explicit, but, we, but there's no exact stories of it. This is how the other Gospels don't have anything like this. John is unique. It says this, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. Sounds like it, right? I didn't cover baptism before, did I? Really quick. I knew that about the what John the Baptist was doing. All right, so John the Baptist was baptizing in the wilderness. We all hear that story, and then Jesus comes and all right. John didn't invent baptism. There was this ritualistic bath that non-Jews could go through in order to become as close to Judaism as possible. They wouldn't, wouldn't become a Jew, but they could go pretty close. They were called God-fearers, God-fearers. That's why in the book of Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, it talks about all these people from all these different countries all over the place gathering in Jerusalem and Pentecost happens. You wonder, why are those people all over the different countries coming? They're not all Jews. Most of them are God fears. God fears. And then from that event at Pentecost, they go out back home and they kind of spread the gospel that way. Anyway, John the Baptist was doing before John the Baptist. People had this ritualistic cleansing. But John the Baptist went to the wilderness, and here's the offense. He said in good southern drawl, all y'all. How was that? Pretty good. 
pretty good. All y'all have to get into the water. And the great offense was these Jewish Pharisees came out and they said, do you know who I am? Do you know that I'm a charter member of this church? Do you know why my mom is on church council? Do you know that I go all the way back in my pedigree? So these Pharisees were just incensed that John said, you all have to get into the water. That's part of that original sin. Now, he wasn't doing a Christian baptism because there wasn't Christianity, right? He was doing a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And then with Jesus' baptism from then on, it takes on that Trinitarian when Jesus says, go out into all the world and the Matthew's gospel and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Then it takes on that Trinitarian understanding. So here Jesus sounds like he's baptizing, but we don't know any specific. John also was baptizing. Uh, much water. People came. No, John, let's go on. 25. We talked about this last night, the dispute. Who was greater, Jesus or John? Now a discussion arose between John's, God, John's disciples and the Jewish over purifying. They came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you bore witness is also baptizing, and everyone's going to him. It's like, you know, you heard this preacher down the block. They're all leaving your church, and you're, they're going to him. And most of us would find some ways to downplay that. Oh, that's not the, that's not that great. You know, we've got, you know, we still have a bit of a youth group here. We've got a piano player. We can stay here. But John doesn't do that. Verse 27, John answered, no one can receive anything except which is given to him from heaven. No one, no, not one. We are receivers of God's grace. 28, you yourself bore witness to me that I said I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. 30 is the key one. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's go on. Chapter four, you remember Samaria? We talked about this the first week. The Samarians, how they got a bad name after what evil empire came down to destroy the Northern Kingdom? Good, Assyria, that's right. Assyria came down in 722. They destroyed the Northern Kingdom of Israel. But they didn't just destroy it and ransack and burn it. They intermarried with the Jews living in Samaria. So these are the original Muggles. They're half-breeds. They're Assyrians and they're Jews. But it was 700 years ago. How long do you hold a grudge? 700 years ago. The Assyrians intermarried with the Jews in Samaria. So that's why we hate Samaritans. That's why we hate Samaritans. And most of the time, you know, you have in the north, you have Galilee, and that's where Jesus is from. That's where Nazareth is. That's where the Sea of Galilee is. And then you go south to get to Jerusalem. The problem is Samaria is right smack dab in the middle. So most Jews traveling either way would go way out of their way to walk around Samaria, Samaria so they wouldn't have to mingle with those Samaritans. But Jesus doesn't go around Samaria. He goes right through the middle. So chapter 4. Now when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize. There it is. There it is. I forgot about that verse. Even though the previous chapter implies it. I don't know why that was a big deal. I don't know why that was a big deal. Probably, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I do know. Um, 
probably because um, in 1 Corinthians, there was an argument about who was a better Christian based on who baptized you. And some people are saying, well, I was baptized by Paul, and I was baptized by Apollos, and I was baptized by so-and-so. And Paul finally put that all to a squash. He says, that means nothing. That means nothing. It doesn't matter who baptized you. But if you were baptized by Jesus, just think of the bragging rights. And perhaps, and I don't know this to be true, but perhaps by 90 AD, when John's writing his gospel, perhaps there was a group of people that were saying, you know, my family, they're baptized by Jesus himself. That's right. So we've got a little, you know, extra blessing. Full consciousness at our death, which is nice. Where's that from? Caddyshack? Did you ever watch Caddyshack with... <laughs> Bill Murray meeting the Dalai Lama. He's got full consciousness. Let's go on. All right. We watched it on the experience tour bus. <laughs> there was one scene in there that you should not have seen on the, uh, I mean, from what I read, I read the transcript. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Verse three. He left Judea, that's in the north, and departed to Galilee. He had no Judea is in the south. Sorry, Judea is in the south. He went north. He had to pass through Samaria. He came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and so Jesus, weary as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was the sixth hour. What does your say? Sixth hour? Noon. The hours begin at six a.m. So sixth hour would have been noon. All right. Details matter. Details. Why in the world do we care what time of day it was that Jesus sat by the well? Except that if you're in the desert and it's at noon, it's hot. A lot of people during this time, they would travel. They would travel at night and they would sleep during the day because it was too hot to travel. So he gets there at noon. Let's see what happens. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Let's stop there. Why in the world would you draw water at noon of all times? Because you can't go any other time. Because you can't go any other time. Most of the women and probably the daughters, they would take that mile, two mile, who knows how long. They would take a walk in the morning to get their pails of water. It was certainly so they could, you know, wash and cook and clean and whatever else. But it was probably, probably a real social thing. This was the time that you talked and you connected and aunts and nieces and grandmothers and daughters were able to connect because the rest of the time life in the first century was hard life of the first century you were like a squirrel in that you spent your whole day getting finding storing food because food was so scarce but the only time that you had that opportunity to connect and have those relationships and, and mentor your niece or your granddaughter or whatever else is that walk, the one, two, three miles over to the well and back. Unless, unless you are a woman with a reputation and you are not allowed to join the others scorn and, and cast aside. So she comes at noon. Now, let's go on. Jesus said to her, give me a drink of water. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Oh, big social taboo going on here. What's going on here, taboo? A man 
by himself and a woman that he's not married to or related to alone together by a well apart from everybody else. You should not be in that situation. The Samaritan woman said to her, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Look at the next line. For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. How? Gives you a clue about the audience, right? Jewish audience, you wouldn't have to add that. There's a Gentile audience here. So what's the big deal? 700 years ago. Here's a big deal. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, another woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from himself, the sons of his cattle? And Jesus said, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. The water I give him will become to him like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to her, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here again to draw. Now I tried at the very end to say that as blandly as possible. But let me suggest another reading. I wish Holy Scripture would give us, like when you're reading a play and it has little parentheses, he says with a scorn or with a laughter or whatever else. You wonder how these words were originally said. Here's a woman who has a reputation. She has already had five husbands, we'll find out later on. She can't go with the other women because nobody wants that kind with us. She goes to the well at noon and she finds a man there sitting all by himself who now engages in conversation with her. If you're that woman, what do you think that man wants? water? Maybe not. Especially when this man at the well doesn't care about social boundaries of Jews and Samaritans. Especially when he has one of the best pickup lines ever. If you knew the gift of God who is here asking you for a drink, you would have asked me. <laughs> I'm going to give you living water that you'll never have to draw again. And you wonder at the very end line here at the verse, if she says this with complete and utter scorn and sarcasm, perhaps she's saying it this way, right, right, sir, I would like some of this water that I may never be thirsty again in this desert and never have to come to this stinking well again at noon all by myself. She's probably saying it that way rather than, really? Show me. I would love to have such water. There's some dynamic going on here that um, is probably above confirmation age teaching. So Jesus changes tactics, doesn't he? Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. <laughs> A trick question, right? The woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right in saying you have no husbands, for you've had five husbands, and the one you are now with is not really your husband, is he? And in verse 19, one of the most understated lines in the whole Bible, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> Our fathers worshipped here on this mountain. You say that Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. See, at this point, Samaritans had their own mountain, their own temple, their own worship space, and they weren't allowed 
to go to Jerusalem to worship there. So they, they create their own worship space. So now she's saying in our tradition, this is the place, your tradition, Jerusalem is a place. And, and Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. That's a tough word, from. Mine says from the Jews. What does yours say? Through the Jews. Any other? Because how do you interpret that? Salvation comes from, on the one side, it could be it is it is coming, taking away from the Jews and now going into all the world, into the Gentile world. First Samaritan beyond, or through that is Jesus, then is the, the natural and the spiritual fulfillment of Judaism. Now no longer for the Jewish people, but for the whole world. You see the difference here? Even today, even today, you don't see a whole lot of Jewish missionaries out there, do you? Um, I mean, there's not a lot of, there's not any, because Judaism is, is a fairly closed circle, fairly closed circle. What Jesus is doing now is going through Judaism, but not stopping there but yet going out into all the world. And we won't get into this tonight, but when we get into Romans, the next book we're going to go through, probably sometime in 2023, the, the, the speed we're going through this. <laughs> but in Romans, it talks about that salvation, that it was necessary for the Jews to reject Jesus so that the gospel could be catapulted into the whole world. That's according to Romans 9 through 11. It makes that argument there. It, it kind of makes sense here. If Jesus had been embraced by Judaism, they might have just kept him unto himself. This is a part of the circle. But the rejection catapults Jesus and the gospel, more importantly, into all the world, as John 3, 16 says, for God so loves the world. All right, um, verse 23, but the hour is coming. What's that refer to? The crucifixion. When you talk about my time has not come, it's time for my glorification. When the Son of Man is lifted up, my hour, the time, that's the crucifixion. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Perhaps you've heard those words before. We're going to worship in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must also worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to her, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, will show us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, this is where the English will will miss out on the deep meaning of this. I am he. I am. You remember the burning bush with Moses. So Moses comes to the burning bush, takes off his shoes. God says, I've heard the groaning of my people for how many years in Egypt? 450 years or something. Now, I want you to go back to old Moses and say, let my people go. And Moses, Moses has like four or five excuses why he's not the right guy. And, uh, and he says, the first one is, if I go there, they're going to ask me who sent me. Who shall I say sent me? And here, God takes a huge risk. God tells Moses his name. And what's his name? I am who I am. I am who I am. Or in Hebrew, Yahweh. Yahweh. 
It is the divine name of God. Now, why is that so significant? When I was 26 years old, right out of seminary at my first church, kind of still trying on this identity of being a pastor. I'm with my first confirmation class. Do you know that Natalia Lightbolt was in my first confirmation class? <laughs> she was the first one to babysat piano with her mom. I made sure her mom was there too. But Natalia was the most mature eighth grader you're ever going to meet. Anyway, so I'm with the confirmands, and I think one of the parents say, what, what shall they call you? And because I wasn't quite comfortable with this whole pastoral thing yet, I said, you can call me Scott. So for that first year, suddenly these sixth, seventh, eighth graders are calling me Scott. Then I can say, did, did you get your confirmation papers done? No, I'll get it to you next week, Scott. You know, what about, are you going to be doing this or that? No, we thought we wouldn't, Scott. And pretty soon they ran over me. That's why when first year teachers go into the classroom, they're not Scott or Susan or Bob. They are Mr. and they are Mrs. So the next year when confirmation came, what should we call? You call me Pastor Scott. And it changed. Now, I'm not saying that so that you're going to call me Pastor Scott from now on. You certainly can, whichever Scott or Pastor Scott, because it's the gray hair that makes the difference from a 26-year-old. But here is God giving Moses his first name. Very, very risky. His name is I am. Now, Moses has a whole lot of other excuses, too. But since this is the holy name of God, I am, whenever that word comes up in Scripture, in the Old Testament, um, some translations will say Yahweh, the actual Hebrew. Others will call it just the Lord. Whenever it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the Old Testament, that's Yahweh. That's the holy name of God. But if you're, um, but if you're a, a, a conservative Jew, when you read through that and you come to that word, you're not going to say Yahweh, because these lips cannot utter the name of God. What's the word they use? Anybody know? Adonai. Adonai. John is the only gospel. That refers that Jesus refers himself as I am. Jesus calls himself the holy, sacred name of God. That's why the Pharisees begin picking up stones. Not because he said, I am a door, I am the life, I am the bread, I am the gift of heaven. Nobody picks up a stone and kills you when you call yourself. A piece of bread, right? It is that Jesus used I am. Now, really quick, really quick lesson in Greek. Now, some of you have taken different languages, and there are some languages in which you just look at the verb, and you can tell if it's male, female, or neuter. You can talk and see if it's um, plural or singular, right? Some other what other language does that? Spanish. Will Spanish do that? You can tell from, uh, from a verb, just a verb, if it's male or female, if it's masculine, female, so on. Okay, same thing with Greek. Um, the word um, aimi. Aimi, is, you know it's first person. You know it's male. And you can just put down the word aimi, and it is... I am, I am, in present tense, present tense. But in John's gospel, whenever Jesus uses that, he could just say a me, but he doesn't. Every time he does this, he uses the word I before it. So, and the word I is 
ego, from which we get the word ego, which is I. So whenever Jesus is saying, I am bread, I am the life, I, he's saying, ego, a me. I am bread. I am life. And even here at the end, this is the first of the I am statements. He who speaks to you, I am. Now, you can't translate it in English that way. It says, I am he, but I am. He uses the holy name of, of, of God. Meanwhile, the disciples found him, said, Rabbi, eat. You're so skinny. But he said to them, I have, uh, I have food to eat of which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him any food? You know, he's been out in the sun. It's noon. He's going delirious now. Jesus said, my food, and so on, so on, so on. All right, so 39. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of your words that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Who is the first proclaimer of Jesus Christ? <laughs> a woman of Samaria. A woman of Samaria. Who are the first proclaimers of the resurrection? The women. Mary running back and saying, come and see. The Lutheran Church, at least our branch of the Lutheran Church, has been ordaining women since 1970. Some other branches, of course, don't. But ours since 1970. And as I think about that theological debate, it really had to come down to, biblically speaking, who were the first proclaimers? And not just the first proclaimers, I suppose anybody could proclaim, but whose first proclamation changed the lives and the hearts of others? And we go back to the Samaritan woman, woman, and we go back to the women at the resurrection. So women have been the very first preachers and proclaimers of the gospel. Oh, we'll see how far we get. Verse 46. So he came again to Cana in Galilee. What happened in Cana? The water into wine. Good. The first miracle. Where he made the water wine. Oh, you just read on, didn't you? There, there we go. <laughs> and at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When he heard that Jesus was coming from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus therefore said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That you in that sentence is plural. So perhaps here Jesus is not saying to this official, you personally, you're not going to believe unless he's probably saying to the spectators around him, signs and wonders will be a very important tipping point in the people believing who Jesus is. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, sir, come down here. My child dies. Oh, you come down here before my child dies. Jesus says, go and your son will live. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. He went down, his servants met him and told him that his son was living. And so they asked him the hour when this happened. Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left. And that's exactly when Jesus said, your son will live. Verse 54, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come down from Gal Judah to Galilee. So now we have water into wine, perhaps an allusion to the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood spilled. After that, we had the cleansing of the temple, the body being raised, and now we have new life happening here. There's a good sequence that's going on 
with these different miracles. And we have yet another miracle here in chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, there by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Hebrew called Bethsaida. Just five porticles in these lay a multitude of invalids, lame, blind, paralyzed. One man had been there how long? 38 years. 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been lying there a long time, he said, do you want to be healed? Seems like a silly question, doesn't it? Do you want to be healed? So here was the deal. The people would hang around these five pools. And at some unpredictable time, they would, some, they would suddenly roil up. I don't know if all five or a single one at a time. I don't know that. But it was certainly kind of like an artesian well or something that would just. And the idea was, if you were the first one in the pool at the time of the roiling, you'd be healed. So he asked, do you want to be healed? And you said, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is troubled. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. So for 38 years, he's tried to be the first one to get into the pool. And Jesus says to him, get up. Rise and take your pallet and walk. And once the man was healed, he took up his pallet and he walked 38 years later. But it was the Sabbath, right? So the Jews said to the man who was cured, it's the Sabbath. It's not law for you to be carrying your pallet. This is the difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Remember that... Um, that uh, the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So when you think about these slaves coming from Egypt on their way over to the promised land, one of the first thing God gives them is a new constitution. Ten laws. And they're given to them as gifts. That is, life is precious. Do not murder. That is, the, the marriage covenant is to be sacred. Do not commit adultery. The things that God gives you are a blessing. Don't spend your time coveting what the other person has. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What a gift. How much time off do you suppose these slaves had in Egypt building bricks? Zero, right? Zero. And here God says, I'm going to give you six days of hard work. You can work six days. Just like God worked in creation six days. On the seventh day, I want you to rest. It is meant to be a gift. And because original sin, we want to become like God. Suddenly we take control of that. Suddenly we take control. You can't work well. How far can I walk? And it's no longer pleasure, but it's work. How much food can I produce for my family on that day? And it's no longer providing for my family, but it's feeding my family. It's not work. And so pretty soon, that which began as a gift, because we turned it inward and turned it from the spirit to the letter of the law, it now becomes legalistic. The Pharisees see the man with a pallet. You're not supposed to carry a pallet. By the way, that's why on Providence Road, you see people, the more Orthodox Jews, walking on Providence Road to get to the Jewish Community Center. Because it is also about building a fire. You can't build a fire. That's work. So that's why when you start your car, you're really creating a fire. That's why they walk. I um, Years ago, I was doing a radio show with one of the rabbis over there. And uh, we, would, uh, we would field questions together. 
and um, and what questions got into was was work on a, on, on the Sabbath. And I, and I kind of challenged him a little bit. I said, well, aren't you working on the Sabbath? That is, you hold worship services, you've prepared a sermon, you have to show up, you get a paycheck. Aren't you working on the Sabbath? And uh, he said, we make very, we're very careful in making sure that I don't break. I said, well, how do you do that? I said, well, I, I walk and come to, um, to church. He says, down to the microphone. I can't turn on my own microphone because that electricity creates a spark, which is making fire. And so somebody else has to turn the microphone on. Then I said, well, somebody then is turning it on. Somebody is doing it. So you're letting them break the Sabbath. But while you see the letter of the law and the spirit is supposed to be a gift. They catch this man here carrying a pallet, probably skipping. It's a Sabbath, not lawful, 11, but the answer to him, the man who healed me said, take up your pallet and walk. Who am I to disagree with this guy? They asked him, who said to you, take up your pallet? 13, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse befalls you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews persecuted Jesus because he did this on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working still and I am working. This is why the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he called God his father. This is why they put him to death. We talked about that, not for, for calling himself a piece of bread, not for loving people, not for healing people, but because he equated himself with God. First with the divine name, I am, and now by calling God his father, making himself equal to God. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son of man, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing for whatever he does, that the Father, the Son does likewise. Truly, truly, I say to you, oh yeah, here, 24, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has, not will, isn't that interesting? has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. In theological circles, we call this realized eschatology. Realized eschatology. Eschatology refers to the end times. Eschatos, end times, ology, the study of and then the realized part is the, that means that we are experiencing it right now. It is the realized eschatology that I have life right now. And what that means is the joy that we have for eternal life, we experience right now. The love that we share to one another is part of that eternal life. We're not just waiting here to escape this drudgery of this life, to kind of bear through it. So one day, one day, we can finally receive that, those blessings. John's gospel, more than any other, is saying it's here, it's now, we're living it. And the fullness is yet to come. Now, why is that important? Paul, again, writing in the 50s, the 60s, Paul, Paul firmly believed that Jesus was coming back soon. In fact, Paul told people, if you're married, stay married. If you're single, stay single. Unless you're going to burn in passion and then go get married. But stay married, stay single. Because the Lord is coming any moment now. And you don't want to distract yourself with everything else going on. 
Paul fully, fully expected the resurrection to happen. And then you have Mark. It's been a while now. <laughs> it's been 30 years. So Mark says it's coming soon. Saying that there are, in fact, Jesus lips here. He says, there are those who will not experience death before my return. And you have Matthew and Luke. It's been another 20 years. We're still on our tiptoes. We're still looking off on the horizon. We're still saying any day now, any day now, he'll be here. And they push it off a little bit further. Now you have John's gospel, the last one. It's been 60 years. How much longer can you stand in your tiptoes before your calves cramp up? How much longer can you be staring off until you go blurry? How much longer can you say any day now until you grow hoarse? So John changes the theology to a realized eschatology. That is, the blessings are still to come, and they're going to be amazing, and it's going to be all that. But they don't begin there. They begin here, in the fullness of life that we have right now in Christ. And now it's 2021. We're still on our tiptoes. We're still looking outside. Let me back it up. Martin Luther fully expected Jesus to come back. The early church fathers fully expected Jesus to come back during their lifetime. And even today, we're still talking about the imminent return of Jesus, which kind of begs the question, was Paul wrong? Were Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrong? Was Martin Luther and St. Augustine, were they wrong? Am I wrong during Advent when I say he is coming soon? Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. It might be wrong from a strict chronological argument. But it's not wrong in the way that we live out our lives. Because we live each day with the expectation that one day he is coming. And every day, every day he does not come is not one more day of disappointment, but what? One more day of grace. First Peter says every day of his delay is one more day of grace that more people can hear the gospel and receive eternal life. But the fact that we live each day with the anticipation, the expectation that, that Jesus is coming is a day full of great, what? Joy, expectation, anticipation, living in such a way that, um, that we would, um, that we prepare ourselves. We are always prepared. I remember seeing a bumper sticker one time that says, Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. <laughs> it's not that. It's living with that expectation. So there's a professor I had. And you know, PhDs from the highest universities and smart guy and, you know, reading, writing all the books, the whole egghead. And, um, and he said, you know, even... Even today, when I go outside and it's a cloudy day, no, and it's a clear Carolina blue day without a cloud in the sky, I kind of say, not today. Because remember when he comes back, he's going to come back in the clouds. Now he knows, he knows it's not to be literal. He's a smart guy, but there's a part of him where his heart leaps when he walks outside. And some of those big, billowing, fluffy clouds are up, up in the sky. And he says to himself, 
Maybe today. Maybe today that Jesus will come back. And if he is, stir up your power, O Lord, and come. For I have waited my life for this day, and I am ready. Were all those people wrong? No. Because as Christians, we live out each day with that flutter in our heart, thinking to ourselves, maybe today. And I'm ready for Jesus' sake. Amen. Sounds like a sermon, right? Amen. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to draw a line here. 25. Chapter 5, 25. We went to three, four, two and a half chapters. That's pretty good, isn't it? All right. Thank you for joining us here online. Ryan, you shy guy. You're not going to show your nice face. All right. I understand that. Oh, that's good. Nice seeing you, say. Oh, Sarah, you, can you move, Sarah? Oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> a nice picture there. Good deal. We'll see you next week. I'm going to stop the recording here, too. Maybe if I just turn it off, we'll stop, right? Yeah.